it is coming up a little bit past 11. Um, and so there's uh, what, 67 people in the room right now and a few, I'm sure a few more will jump on. But I'm gonna go ahead and um, start this up. Um, I wanna welcome everyone to uh, Scott Gabara's defense, Scotty's defense. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I think the number of people that are jumping on this is a testament to not only Scotty's personality and the friends he's made, but also the influence he's had both in our department and other places. Um, you know, most of, many of you who have been around Scotty for a while have relied on him for one thing or another and know that um, he's been just invaluable help for so many things, you know, from experimental design all the way up through analysis using R to stable isotopes. He's been invaluable to my lab. A um, couple things about Scotty um, before I go. Um, so Scotty uh, did his undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. Um, go slugs, that's where I did my uh, PhD. He finished in 2007. Um, he then um, worked for a terrestrial restoration group um, with, at Moss Landing Marine Lab, John, John Oliver's group, before he went to uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs, another alma mater of mine, um, to get his uh, master's where he went, was there from 2010 to 2014. I met Scotty when I was uh, on leave from San Diego State um, and doing a uh, visiting faculty there. Um, I worked, got the chance to work with Scotty um, with his uh, work on rotoliths out of Catalina Island. Um, and um, it was pretty much after, you know, working with him for a bit and then get, um, I received an NSF grant to go work up to the Aleutians and work in the Aleutians. And it was an easy call for me to, to make both of his, his skills and his competency in the field and as well as his personality. And I saw how hard he worked, um, just learning multivariate statistics. Every time I'd meet, he would advance what he knew. So that was um, really nice to see. A couple of things about um, Scotty. Um, he uh, uh, has already published a couple of papers out of his master's degree. Um, one in MEP, Marine Ecology uh, Progress Series, one in Marine Biology. He's a co-author on a paper we have in PLOS One. He currently has three papers in review. Um, one of them is Proceedings of the Royal Academy B. Um, it got out for, for review, um, so that's a testament right there. Um, he's also got paper in review on Ecosphere and Marine Bio, and we've got a, a series of papers um, com, uh, that are, were coming up out of a project we had out in Catalina. He's received um, uh, honorable mention in his talks at WSN and a base, best student paper at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. So, and he's gotten, had several grants. So academically, I think Scotty um, has shown his, his, just his competency and how good he is. Um, before we uh, let, turn this over to Scotty, I do wanna say that, you know, those of you who have been around on my lab know that um, I go and I read um, people's, uh, my students' uh, letters of in interest. And I like to quote things from the letters of interest during um, the introduction to see, did they follow through with them? How well did they do that? Um, unfortunately, those of you who know, uh, life sciences is flooded um, and it's not accessible. So I went back into my memory and I, and I could remember certain things Scotty said. I can remember them actually pretty well. So I'm gonna share with you just a couple of things that Scotty said. It's from my memory, but I think it's pretty close. All right, so let's take a look at this. So here we go. So what I remember of Scotty's letter of interest. The first thing I remember what Scotty said was, I really don't know much about the underwater realm. I saw uh, Finding Nemo and just fell in love. Could there be anything so awesome? I dreamed of where I had warm water currents, to places unknown and seeing all that's the under the sea. Coming to your lab would help me see all the marvels the subtitle world has to offer. I wonder what it's gonna be like. Please accept me your lab and let me look down there. That was on his first page. And I think Scotty followed through and was able to do that. Um, not quite diving, but he got to see the underwater realm. Another thing I remember from Scotty's uh, letter of intent was, you know, all of us who have been around Scotty know he loves cooking and boy, the breads he would bring into the lab that were awesome. He's a great cook, great baker, and he loves um, uh, baking. Um, he loves cooking and baking, but what I really want to do is expand my recipe book to include new coffee flavors because he knew I like coffee. And I think your lab are offering me great opportunities such as fish and foods at Triton. Um, it's going to be a dark roast. And so he, here's he and Jacob uh, trying out his new recipe. I don't think Scotty liked his new recipe all that much. Um, he's always loved animals. They're so cute and cuddly, but sometimes I dream that I want to 
that I am one, but really I want to know how they feed. What do they eat? Where do they forage? I think your lab will let me do all these things. You're going to see today, this is what Scotty did using isotopes. This is from this supplemental paragraph. I mean, it was a lot. It was a big letter, Scotty. But um, Scotty got to actually look and see what raccoons do. Um, foraging. One thing people don't know about him is that his absolute favorite movie in the world was The Karate Kid. I mean, who didn't love Daniel, right? Um, I would love to figure out how to emulate his hero while learning about kelp. And Scotty got to do this in the Aleutians. <laughs> and then the last thing I'll, I'll say about Scotty before I turn it over him is that, you know, one of the things that we're looking for is science communication, new ways of reaching new audiences. And Scotty actually put this in his letter of intent. It's one of the greatest things scientists can do um, is learn science communication. I mean, so many great examples of combining science and art, for example. I want to combine, he wanted to combine science and fashion. He has so many great ideas for making a light and clothing that is both comfortable and teaches people about Estes Trophic Urchin Otter Cascade. And Scotty got to do that as well. So one of the things, you know, so as Scotty came to my lab, you know, I, I going back over his letter of intent and, you know, he got to work in the Aleutians, got to work underwater, got to do food webs, science communication. So Scotty really was able to pursue these interests and did a very good job of fulfilling what he wanted to do in the, uh, in his um, letter of intent. So then what I'm going to say about all that is I'm going to turn this over to Scotty. Um, and Scotty, you're of course, you can take the, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to turn this over and welcome Scotty, and he's going to tell us what he did um, for his doctorate. So, Scotty, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. Um, so what uh, we'll try to do here, I'm going to maximize my screen. <clears throat> so I'm going to have uh, that little block up in the top right-hand corner is the speaker view. And if you um, click on the show active speaker video, ideally you can put my little box up there. Uh, I'm going to do that here, so I won't be able to see people during the talk. Um, but I'm doing that because I'm going to record this. There's a few people that um, aren't able to make it. And um, I think when, with that video over to the side, it's going to be uh, more easy to see the talk. So let's see, hide my meeting controls. So um, thank you all for coming. Today, um, I get to talk about my dissertation, The Causes and Consequences of Kelp Forest Foundation Species Loss. Uh, first of all, thank you to my committee members for being here. Um, many different mentors over the years, my family, my friends. Um, I appreciate you spending time to um, check this out. So my dissertation revolves around what are the consequences of losing kelp? And in the first chapter, I looked at how um, the loss of biodiversity in kelp forests, the loss of both kelps um, and other macroalgae as well as consumers leads to this uh, reduction in the trophic complexity or food webs um, in kelp forests. In the second chapter, I won't have time to talk about this today, but I examined spatial variation in dragon kelp, the main canopy forming kelp in the Aleutians, and I looked at stable isotope variation as, and as well um, as elemental concentrations and how those vary across space. In the third chapter, I look at connections between seabirds and seaweeds and how invasive predators might um, uh, reduce that interaction. And in the fourth chapter, I looked at how after you lose kelp in these urchin barrens form, there might be certain changes to species interactions and how macroalgae either allocate energy to growth or defense. So I'm gonna start off with the concept of uh, foundation species. And these are those that provide the primary habitat. Their name often defines the community or ecosystem that they create. In the marine environment, some of the most conspicuous foundation species are kelps, mangroves, salt marsh grasses, corals, seagrasses, and coral and algal rotoliths. And some of the commonalities are they um, ameliorate environmental and predation stress. So they provide the structure that reduces things like wave motion. Their structure collects larvae and food. And so when you lose these species, there's often a dramatic impact on the community. What I'm gonna be focusing on are kelps, and these are brown seaweed in the order Laminariales. And I think kelps might be different than other foundation species in that they're both a trophic resource and a structural resource say relative to corals, uh, mangroves, or coral and algal rotoliths that are potentially mostly structure. They provide a substrate for things to grow on, but may not be a, a trophic resource themselves. So in my first chapter, I looked at uh, biodiversity loss and how that leads to reductions in community-wide trophic complexity. 
we're going to start with the concept of food webs. And these are a network of feeding interactions that we use to make um, a generalized pattern in food web structure. And we make these patterns to ultimately predict how they will change. So we have this central California kelp forest on the right. We have different kelps and uh, phytoplankton supporting many different consumers. And you can use this web to make um, predictions about how um, interactions may change. Uh, say if sea stars are removed due to sea star wasting disease, the Denso virus that reduced their um, many different sea star abundances along the West Coast, there might be certain cascading effects that we see through the food web. So one of the ways to estimate the importance of one of these nodes or food web members is to compare a food web when it's present and when it's absent. And that's the approach that Mike Graham had. He used survey data of kelp forest communities in uh, the Channel Islands in Southern California. And he compared when kelp was present versus when it was absent. And that's due to urchin barren formation where urchins overgraze kelp and other macroalgae. So we have this generalized picture of a kelp forest food web, different primary producers on the bottom, different primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers, many different direct connections from kelp to these primary consumers, and then indirect connections to the rest of the food web. So we can compare this food web when kelp's present versus when it's absent, and we see this 36% decrease in species occurrence, and that's likely due to the energy and the structure that kelps provide. So you can see a loss of a lot of these connections um, from kelp and then reductions in species. So while this work and other work is based on survey data, we have little idea on how um, the loss of kelp and other macroalgae affects the diets of consumers in kelp forests. And one of the ways to do that is by using biochemical tracers like st stable isotopes because they're stored in uh, consumer tissues. Some commonly used isotopes for ecologists are um, uh, delta, thir uh, delta 13 carbon and delta 15 nitrogen. And we uh, use these in for different reasons. So delta-13 carbon is the ratio of a heavier carbon-13 to a lighter carbon-12 isotope, denoted by this delta. And uh, we have these primary producers along this x-axis, and we can see they differ in their delta-13 carbon value. And that's due to differences in photosynthetic pathways and carbon uptake and their boundary layers. So we have this microalgae, oops, let me get my cursor back, microalgae, this green algae, and seagrass. And so they all differ and this isotope is relatively well conserved through the food web. So we're able to use it um, as an indicator as of the food source. We also use delta-15 nitrogen, the ratio of nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14. And we can use this as an indicator of the trophic level because it increases up the food web. So we um, can bring in some consumers. We can see that um, these, these consumers have a relatively similar delta-13 carbon value to the original source of carbon but they have an increase in delta-15 nitrogen. So this doesn't always happen. It's not necessarily as simple as this depiction, but we can use both delta-15 nitrogen and delta-13 carbon to get an estimate of the dietary niche of a consumer. So that's the variation in what consumers eat. So this is some work by Craig Lehman and others, and it um, shows a variation for gray snapper isotope values. So gray snapper, this large labyrinth fish in this uh, intact mangrove habitat. So we, so we see that some of these gray snapper are feeding lower on the food chain on things like bivalves. Some are feeding higher on the food chain on crustaceans or fish. Another way to look at this is that there's many different primary producers, there's many different consumers, and that creates variation in the isotope values of these higher level predators. But when you lose 50% of this mangrove habitat, you see a constriction in the variability in the gray snapper isotope values. So you see a loss of a lot of these higher level predators and a shift in their values toward microalgae. When you lose greater than 90% of the mangrove habitat, you see a further shift towards microalgae and a further constriction in the variability of these gray snapper isotope values. So you have these two sort of extremes of um, high biodiversity and um, high isotopic variability for consumers in this intact mangrove habitat, and then low biodiversity and low isotopic variation for consumers in the degraded habitat. So I wanted to apply this to work done in the Aleutian Islands, and this is work done by Jim Estes and others. And it shows that when sea otters are abundant at certain Aleutian Islands, and that's uh, the Aleutian Island archipelago is that um, the island chain that stretches from mainland Alaska over to Russia. At some of these islands, we see that uh, when otters are abundant, we see a reduction in urchin biomass 
their grazing intensity, and that leads to the proliferation of kelp and other macroalgae. But when we lose sea otters over time, uh, either due to predation by killer whales or during the Pacific Maritime fur trade, when we wanted to harvest uh, sea otters for their comfortable, um, for their pelts to make comfortable clothing or comfortable hats. When you reduce those otter abundances, we see an increase in urchin biomass, their grazing intensity, and a loss of um, kelp and other macroalgae. So the overall question here is, what are the impacts of kelp on nearshore and offshore marine food webs? And can we use urchin barrens as kelp removal areas? So to do that, I'll sample consumer uh, stable isotope values um, in a habitat where kelp and other macroalgae are present within a kelp forest. I can sample consumers within an urchin barren where kelp and other macroalgae are removed. And then I also sampled um, offshore, uh, consumers within offshore habitat. And that's because um, these offshore habitats are below the photic zone. The consumers there are reliant on subsidies, either coming from phytoplankton or from drift algal subsidies that are, that are coming to them. So if consumers look similar isotopically between an urchin barren and an offshore habitat, they might be reliant on similar uh, subsidies. And then when I make these comparisons among um, consumers in these habitats, um, I wanna make them within similar feeding guilds because I want the differences among the habitats to be due to differences in resources that are available and not necessarily how the consumers feed. So the overall question is, is decreasing biodiversity from kelp forest to urchin barrens to offshore habitats reflected in the overall community and then the individual consumer stabilized values? So I'll compare the stabilized to variability first the entire community, and then we can look at the individual consumer guilds to see if they respond in a similar way across this gradient. So to do this, um, we sampled during the summers of 2016 and 2017. I did this across 10 Aleutian Islands that spanned about 1,500 kilometers, collected consumers within the habitats that I just mentioned, and then um, the primary producers and consumers were sampled. I got a lot of help with this. Um, we were sampled via um, quadrant clearings, haphazard collection, and also trawls. So for primary producers, I wanted to get an isotope value for phytoplankton and organic matter in the water column. So I um, designed these pressurizable water collection vessels that use scuba cylinder pressure to push water through these glass fiber filters. And you can see um, the three filters from an urchin barren have very little coloration. And then the three filters from a kelp forest are um, much darker, and that's probably because of the particulate organic matter that are coming off of kelps in that habitat. So I also sampled uh, canopy forming species like Eularia fistulosa, the dragon kelp, different stipitate, subcanopy, brown algae, um, also red algae, uh, green algae, and coralline algae. For the consumers, I divided them into four different uh, guilds uh, that included fish like rockfish, cod, and greenling secondary consumers like crabs, anemones, and sea stars, primary consumers like bivalves, sponges, and chitin, and then also urchins. And for urchins, I divided uh, muscle tissue and gonad tissue. There's dip it, different lipid content and different turnover times, and so that's gonna create differences in their isotope values, so I divided those out. And after 1,277 samples, I was questioning everything, including um, my career in science. So for my methods, I'm going to compare consumer dietary niche breadth using first stable isotopes of entire communities and then the trophic, individual trophic guilds using stable isotope Bayesian ellipses in R. So I'm able to uh, estimate the uh, isotopic area of the 95% confidence interval of points within these groups and then compare them. And then also compare a variety of isotopic range and niche metrics that relate to changes in dietary niches. And um, I'll go over what those are now. So um, as an example, I'm showing the isotope data from a kelp forest and urchins in these lighter shades up to fishes in the darker shades. You can see these ellipses that encompass 95% of those points. And so some of the things that we can compare um, within a habitat or among habitats are the range in delta-13 carbon. So increasing values suggest that there's greater amounts of basal resources that are getting into these consumers. We can compare the range in delta-15 nitrogen with greater values suggesting that there's greater trophic diversity or number of trophic levels. We can compare the isotopic dietary niche space uh, with increasing values suggesting that there's greater dietary niche space being occupied. 
We can also compare the mean distance to centroid with greater values suggesting that there's greater trophic diversity. So these, um, each one of these trophic groups um, has some average value for all of them when they're pooled. And as you separate those, they're becoming more and more trophically dissimilar. And we can also compare the mean nearest neighbor distance with low values suggesting greater trophic redundancy. So just as an example, we can compare the primary consumers in this ellipse on the bottom to secondary consumers uh, in this ellipse on top. And so the points for these primary consumers on the bottom are closer together, that distance is shorter. So it suggests that they're eating more similar things. While the secondary consumers, that distance is greater. And one of the reasons that may be is that secondary consumers are omnivorous. So they're both herbivorous and carnivorous, and that creates variation in their isotope values. So uh, when we compare, uh, uh, this is what the isotope values look like for um, the different trophic groups in the lighter shades. Uh, there's urchins up to the darker shades um, for fishes, and that's um, for the kelp forest in green, the urchin barren in blue, and then the offshore in orange. And so we can um, start to compare some of those metrics across, this, um, across these habitats. So when we look at the delta 13 carbon range for consumers in a kelp forest to an urchin barren, we see about an 8% decrease. And that's um, a pretty conservative estimate because that um, the range in delta 13 carbon is calculated using the um, centroids of these ellipses. So it's a pretty conservative estimate. And then when we compare consumers in a kelp forest to an offshore habitat, we see a 40% increase in their basal resources. So presumably consumers offshore are getting resources from a variety of different places. But overall, this suggests that with biodiversity loss across this gradient, we're seeing uh, reductions in basal resources. And um, when we look at the delta-15 nitrogen range, and for the rest of these niche metrics, they all follow a similar pattern across the gradient that we have. So for consumers in a kelp forest to an urchin barren, we see a 13% decrease in their delta-15 nitrogen range or um, tro um, trophic levels. And then from a kelp forest to an offshore habitat, we see a 62% decrease. So that suggests to me that with biodiversity loss, we're seeing reductions in the trophic level or trophic diversity. See a similar pattern for total area. For consumers in a kelp forest to an urchin barren, we see a 30% decrease in that area. And then for consumers in a, between a kelp forest and an urchin barren, we see a 63% decrease. So that suggests to me with, with biodiversity loss, we're seeing reductions in the isotopic dietary niche space. Similar pattern for mean distance to centroid. When we compare the uh, consumers in a kelp forest to a barren, we see a 21% decrease. And then from a kelp forest to offshore, we see a 41% decrease. So those trophic groups that I made are, are becoming, um, they're getting closer and closer together and eating more similar things. And then when we look at the mean uh, nearest neighbor distance, we see a similar pattern, a 17% decrease between kelp forest consumers and urchin barren consumers, and then a 48% decrease for um, kelp forest consumers to offshore habitat. So that distance among points is getting shorter. Consumers are eating more similar things across this gradient. So now we can look at the individual trophic groups and compare them across those habitats that I sampled and uh, biodiversity loss. And what we see uh, for fishes is, um, I just had to hold this, hide this panel here. Uh, what we see for fishes is there's a decrease from a kelp forest to an urchin barren. So they're lowering their trophic level but they're expanding their dietary niche. So that variability among points is increasing. And then from a kelp forest to offshore habitats, um, the fishes are shifting uh, their trophic level even lower, and then they're increasing their diet even greater. So the variability uh, among individuals is increasing. So this contrasted the four other um, trophic groups that I had. So for secondary consumers and primary consumers, between a kelp forest and an urchin barren, we see relatively similar trophic levels a shift to the right in more enriched values in carbon, and maybe a loss of these more deplete values, a loss of primary producers. And then we see decreases in their um, standard ellipse area or the isotopic dietary niche space. So we're seeing um, uh, similar trophic levels, but decreases in the variability in those isotopes. Urchin, uh, both mussel and gonad have a similar pattern. Um, between kelp forest and urchin barren, we see shifts to the right, a relatively similar trophic level, and then decreases in their dietary niche space. So I think we can use urchins to try to understand how um, uh, the sources of the base of the food web change uh, when you lose kelp and other macroalgae. 
So we have uh, the isotope values for urchins in a kelp forest. We see relatively wide variability in delta-13 carbon. They're eating a lot, uh, a lot of different things. Um, when you look at the isotope variability for kelp, um, it matches that variability. So potentially these urchins are eating kelp and other macroalgae across this range. And then when you look at urchins in an urchin barren, we see a constriction in that variability, a loss of these more deplete values. And that variability happens to match what um, the organic material and coral and algae look like isotopically. So that suggests to me, at least for urchins, there's this shift to the right uh, towards coral and algae as the base of the food web and a loss of other sources. So what we found is that there's a collapse in the food web in urchin barrens, and in, it's due to the loss of food resources for both omnivores and herbivores. And that leads to the reduction in community-wide isotopic dietary niche breadth. So another way to look at this is the convex hulls of the isotope points for primary consumers. So we see this relatively wide variability in what primary consumers eat in a kelp forest. We see a reduction in that variability for consumers in an urchin barren. And then when you look at secondary consumers, it's a similar pattern. Um, and when you look at the tertiary consumer isotope values, it almost looks like they're resting on top of these other trophic groups. And so this suggests to me that there's actually a, a reduction in the trophic level in the urchin barren habitat um, with biodiversity loss there. So in conclusion, uh, stable isotope values of consumer tissues reflected a reduction in trophic interactions with biodiversity loss. Like the mangrove habitat, um, what we saw with mangrove habitat, if you think back to the work by Craig Lehman with those gray snapper, with kelp loss, we see this reduced consumer dietary niche estimate and that matched what um, uh, gray snapper look like isotopically when you lose biodiversity. But contrasting that work, we saw that fishes were able to shift their diet to feed lower on the food chain and then broaden their diets, potentially to compensate for resource loss. So I equate this to people, if, we, um, if a restaurant closes or a grocery store closes, we're gonna shift where we go to get our resources or expand our range to get the resources that we need. And this might also help explain why fish assemblages are similar between kelp and barren habitats. Fishes are changing their foraging ecology based on the resources that are available. And this also brings up to me, um, are food web impacts of kelp forest loss similar across the range of kelps? The main canopy forming species that we looked at was Eularia fistulosa, a canopy forming annual species. So the community is used to losing that every year. The impact of losing canopy forming species in other parts of kelp's range might be different. Say in Southern California, where you have giant kelp, they're a perennial, they can live say two to uh, seven years. And so the community isn't used to losing that um, resource. Um, so the, the impact might be much more dramatic. And then is this similar across all foundation species? I think for kelps, they're both a, a trophic resource and a structural resource in, in at least certain places in their range. And that might contrast mangroves and coral reefs and coral and alvarolis that are mainly the structural resource. They provide a substrate for epiphytic algae and other things to grow on, but aren't necessarily a trophic resource themselves. So we're going to shift gears and talk about how kelp can be a sponge for consumer-derived nutrients. So we know that ecosystems are connected, and that's via spatial subsidies, like the flow of nutrients, energy, and material. And some of the first examples that come to my mind are salmon that grow up in the freshwater environment they move offshore into the marine environment, presumably because there's a lot of resources in the marine environment, and then they vector those nutrients back to the freshwater environment and subsidize diets of consumers like bears. Um, also, kelps are very productive, and um, whether they slough off material or they're dislodged, that organic material can subsidize the rocky and sandy intertidal when that material is deposited uh, inshore, and then it can also um, uh, move offshore and subsidize offshore systems. Some of the consequences of those um, subsidies are an increase in productivity and biomass and then also diversity in the recipient system. So we know that um, consumers can act as nutrient vectors. Um, mobile consumers can act as these biological pumps between ecosystems and they can do that via nutrients in their waste products. Limiting nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus can, be, um, can stimulate growth. We know that with people, if there's too much eutrophication, that can be a problem. Some examples of mobile consumers are seabirds, penguins, sea lions, and um, fishes. Some of the clearest examples of some of the consequences of um, consumer-derived nutrients uh, is this work by Don Kroll and others. And it showed on some of the Aleutian Islands, when seabird abundance is relatively high, there's a different terrestrial community. 
and greater percent nitrogen in grass, and then also forbs, and forbs are herbaceous plants. But when you lose seabirds to invasive predators like foxes, we see a decrease in seabird abundance, we see a different terrestrial community, and we see decreases in grass percent nitrogen and uh, forb percent nitrogen. And that's because um, um, seabird guano is about 80% uric acid. And uric acid is mineralized into bioavailable, bioavailable ammonium and also nitrate. And these nutrients fertilize soils and also plants when foxes are not present. And what's pretty cool is we can use nitrogen isotopes to see a shift in the baseline and where nutrients are coming from. So we see um, in these fox-free islands, when seabirds are present, we see higher nitrogen values, these blue bars, for soil, grass, forbs, mollusks, passerine birds, uh, flies, and also spiders. And of course, those nutrients don't just stop in the terrestrial environment, they can move offshore into the marine environment. And some of the, um, I think, clearest examples of that are work done in um, uh, the tropics. So seabirds are vectoring uh, nutrients from offshore, they feed offshore, and then they either deposit their waste in the near shore directly, indirectly onto land, and through precipitation and leaching, these nutrients can um, uh, uh, get vectored into the near shore. And then presumably uh, have impacts on primary production and uh, growth, primary producer growth and survival. And so part of the hypothesis here is that there would be decreasing influence of these consumer de derived nutrients in the near shore as you move offshore. This is some work um, done by Candida Savage, um, and that's exactly what we see. The endosymbionts in coral, those zooxanthellae that are in coral, can be extracted, and then we can look at the delta 15 nitrogen value, and we see higher values of those endosymbionts closer to shore where they're getting nutrient subsidies, and then there's this decrease as you move offshore to baseline in organic um, nitrogen values. So some of the consequences of these nutrients can be um, uh, increases in primary producer growth. So when seabirds are present, um, this is also work done by Candida Savage. When seabirds are present, we see an increase in the linear extension of corals by four times. And when um, seabirds are absent due to the um, invasive rats on certain islands, we see about four times less growth. And you can do this reciprocal transplant to see that there's probably something going on between seabirds and increasing growth of corals. But we also know that um, our ability to detect where uh, nutrients are coming from can be affected by environmental factors. So temperature can affect the metabolism of primary producers and consumers, and upwelling can affect um, nutrient availability. So some work done by Melissa Foley and Paul Koch showed that um, giant kelp in California um, has low delta-15 nitrogen values when cold, nutrient-rich upwelled water uh, occurs. So presumably, stronger, there would be a stronger consumer-derived nutrient signature in non-upwelling areas with warmer, uh, warmer seawater. We also know that precipitation can be a critical transport mechanism that links nutrients uh, from consumers to producers. When we, when we look at um, uh, connections between consumers and producers on um, these arid Baja islands, we only see these connections during wet years. And so, more precipitation might mean more guano input or more nutrient input. And I equate this to anybody that has a garden. If you add fertilizer, the, those nutrients aren't able to be utilized unless you're applying water to the system and making it available. So the goal and hypotheses for this chapter are to determine if seabird-derived nutrients travel through kelp forest communities in the absence of invasive seabird predators. So primary producer uh, isotope values, uh, some of the hypotheses are that primary producer isotope values would increase with increasing seabird densities in the near shore, but not the offshore. Kelp forest community isotope values, the nitrogen isotopes, may increase on islands that have fewer number of years that invasive foxes have been present, higher seabird abundances, greater precipitation and delivery, and higher seawater temperatures and less upwelling. We hypothesize that at seabird islands, increases in these nitrogen isotope values from primary producers to consumers would reflect movement of seabird-derived nutrients through the food web. So just like we talked about in the last chapter, there should be this increase in nitrogen values from the base of the food web on up. So I'm first gonna talk about the, some of the environmental data that I have. So um, across nine different islands, I compared the cumulative number of years that invasive foxes had been present. 
I uh, estimated seabird densities using this OBIS C map that I'll talk about later. Um, I estimated precipitation using the seawater salinity sensors that were on the boat, the research vessel that we used. And then um, I estimated upwelling using seawater temperature sensors that were deployed in kelp forests. And so some of the uh, tests and relationships that I, um, the relationships that I wanted to test were um, the relationship between nearshore and offshore primary producer nitrogen isotope values with increasing seabird densities, and we'd expect a positive relationship. Create um, a principal component analysis so I can consider the cumulative number of years that invasive foxes have been present, seabird densities, precipitation, and temperature. And then I can use the um, principal component axes um, against the kelp forest community and nitrogen values to see if there are relationships there. And then I can use regression intercepts to determine if increases in the isotopes were consistent with seabird subsidies traveling up kelp forests. So we'd expect these increases from the base of the food web on um, up through consumers, just like we talked about in the last chapter. So to estimate seabird densities, I use the Ocean Biodiversity Information System CMAP um, with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Beringian Seabird 2004 data set. And I wasn't sure at what spatial scale I should try to estimate a connection between these seabird consumers and the kelp forest collections that I collected at a site at an island. So I just chose an 11 kilometer diameter circle and then uh, increased that to 22, 33, and then a 66 kilometer diameter circle. Uh, that, those created search areas to estimate um, seabird densities. And then to determine if seabird uh, derived nutrients only occurred within the near shore, we compared relationships between both nearshore and then offshore primary producer nitrogen values with seabird density. So you only expect relationships in the nearshore and not offshore. So here's a, a depiction of the, um, what those collection or search areas looked like for seabird densities. So uh, this is our collection site and this red star. And uh, in this smallest search area, 11 kilometer diameter circle, there's one observation. Those observations increase as you scale up. And at this largest scale, I'm encompassing whole islands or a majority of islands at some, um, at some places. And presumably there's at some scale, this relationship, if there was one, might fall off. So first we're gonna look at the kelp delta 15 nitrogen values, and then also the kelp suspended particular organic matter. So that filtered material um, that I got from kelp forest. So we're looking at those nitrogen isotope values and whether they relate to seabird density. And we'll start at the bottom with the 11 kilometer diameter circle, um, 22, 33, and 66. So we see that there's relationships between these nitrogen isotopes for kelp and then the suspended particular organic matter in kelp forests at these three smaller scales and not at the um, largest scale. And then we look at the nitrogen uh, isotope values for um, phytoplankton that I sampled offshore and uh, seabird abundance. We don't see these positive relationships. So this suggests to me that something may be going on in the near shore. So looking at the seabird abundance, we see it uh, varies across the Aleutian Islands. So this is from um, west to east. The um, seabird that's contributing most to the abundance is this tufted puffin. So that may be an important species to look, uh, to study if there are indeed connections to these consumers. I estimated the uh, total, the cumulative number of years that invasive foxes were present on the, the different islands that I sampled using published data and then also some per personal communication um, as some islands uh, uh, did not have foxes. And then I also estimated the time since erad eradication. So the time since these invasive predators have been removed might be more important in explaining how many seabirds are uh, at an island. So when we look at the relationship between seabird abundance and the cumulative number of years that invasive foxes have been present, we see um, a loose negative relationship. So this makes sense. The longer that you've had foxes, the fewer number of seabirds should be on islands. We actually put foxes on islands to um, uh, consume these seabirds as a food source and then grow foxes up for their pelts. And then uh, the relationship between seabird density and the time since fox eradication is uh, a loose positive relationship. And this makes sense. The longer it's been since um, invasive predators that consume seabirds have been eradicated, um, the greater um, there should be, uh, the higher the abundance of seabirds there should be present. So when we look at the uh, uh, principal component uh, analysis with um, the years that invasive foxes have been present, uh, seabird densities, temperature, and salinity, 
we see that there's variation among islands. Uh, this first principal component explains about 76% of the variation. And so from left to right, you can think that uh, as you move to the right here, there's uh, increasing seabirds, there's um, fewer number of years that invasive foxes have been present, there's islands with warmer seawater and potentially less upwelling, and then also islands with um, lower salinity and potentially more precipitation. So for my kelp forest community collections, um, so just I talked briefly about the food web base that I collected. I also collected primary consumers that were things like uh, sea cucumbers, sponges, urchins, and chitin, and then secondary consumers like anemones, gastropods, and sea stars. And so the, the nitrogen isotope value for these uh, taxa are the response variable. So when we um, look at the relationship between uh, delta-15 nitrogen that I'm calling a, a signal of these consumer-derived nutrients and that first principal component, we see that there's um, an increasing signal with uh, islands with more seabirds, fewer years of invasive foxes, warmer seawater, less upwelling and more precipitation. And these isotope values increase from the base of the food web on up to consumers, whether uh, seabirds are present or not. We can see that um, the, how these nutrients are getting into the food web are through um, absorption by the base of the food web and then working their way on up. So just to reiterate, uh, dividing the variables of that PCA up, we see uh, a greater uh, seabird derived nutrient signal in, on islands that have higher seabird density. We see greater delta-15 nitrogen values or this uh, seabird signal on islands that have um, had uh, foxes for less time. We see a greater uh, signal um, on islands that have higher temperatures. And then we also see a, a greater signal of these nutrients on islands that have lower salinity, so um, or higher, potentially higher precipitation and delivery of these nutrients to the near shore. So this is the, this is the working hypothesis um, that we're trying to fill in. So seabirds are um, consuming nutrients offshore. They're consuming zooplankton and fish. Um, they're vectoring these nutrients either directly into the near shore or indirectly on the islands. And in the absence of invasive predators and through um, precipitation, these nutrients are able to leach into the near shore. Primary producers can uptake these nutrients. They can be consumed directly by herbivores, indirectly by uh, filter feeders or detritivores. And then um, those consumers are consumed by secondary consumers. So um, potentially in the absence of these predators, but also um, the presence of keystone species, both of these are needed for these really long interaction chains to exist. And of course, this connection to um, sea otters needs to get um, worked on. So in conclusion, we found evidence for connections between kelp forest producers and consumers at islands with lower numbers of years that invasive fox have been present at higher uh, islands with higher seabird abundance with greater precipitation and also warmer seawater. So it appears that less disturbed systems may have these longer and more complex interaction chains. So as we perturb these systems, whether we put foxes on islands and they consume seabirds or whether we harvest sea otters for their pelts, we're um, changing these interactions and reducing the length of these interaction chains. And I think that connectivity and positive feedbacks among ecosystems may increase resilience. These nutrients from consumers may be uh, especially important during warm water events. When warm water and low nutrients uh, move through, these uh, consumer-derived nutrients might be pretty important for the um, survival and growth of uh, primary producers and consumers. So we're gonna shift gears and talk about how after you lose kelp and these urchin barrens form, there might be changes to how macroalgae either grow or defend. So we know that herbivores can have dramatic effects on primary producers. So whether um, it's a caterpillar consuming uh, terrestrial plant matter or sea urchins consuming algae, we see these herbivores can, be, um, can have dramatic effects. We also know that predators of these herbivores, the things that eat caterpillars and the things that eat sea urchins can cause these trophic cascades. So they have these positive indirect effects on the base of the food web by eating these herbivores. And then also the presence and absence of predators over long evolutionary timescales can change how these primary producers allocate energy to either growth or defense. So this is some work done by Peter Steinberg and Jim Estes and others, and it shows um, uh, a simple food chain 
in the northern hemisphere where sea otters are present and through grazing urchins cause a low intensity of herbivory of urchins on macroalgae. And when you look at defensive compounds in certain algae, we see a lower percent of those compounds in a fewer number of species. So that contrasts um, what these authors posit, um, a contrasting view of in the southern hemisphere when sea otters, um, there isn't a sea otter equivalent in those systems. So uh, herbivores like urchins will have a high intensity of herbivory on macroalgae uh, and kelps. And when you look at the um, occurrence, the, uh, the percent concentration of these uh, defensive compounds, we see that there's a greater percentage and a greater amount of, uh, of algae. So I wanted to try to apply this to the Aleutian Islands. So we saw this figure before. Um, in this uh, three uh, trophic level food chain, otters are removing urchins and releasing uh, macroalgae from being grazed, and so there might be more growth by these primary producers. They have to deal with competition of other algae shading them, so they might allocate more energy to growth as opposed to defense. But when um, otters are removed in this four trophic level uh, chain, their um, uh, macroalgae might allocate more energy to defense. Now they don't have to deal with competition. If they exist there, they're going to have to deal with this high intensity of herbivory. So I'm wondering if we might find similar findings to that work over shorter evolutionary time scales and then also shorter spatial scales. So I'm using this framework from the terrestrial environment and, uh, as how to predict how primary producers should allocate energy to growth or defense. So for um, macroalgae that are in a kelp forest, there's very high competition. They should allocate more energy to growth and much less to defense. But as you move to an urchin barren state, uh, macroalgae will have uh, low competition, will have, um, have to deal with high herbivory. And then potentially with increasing intensity of herbivory, there might be a greater allocation to defense. So I'm using um, this Codium ritteri, I'll call uh, Codium, it's this green alga that's in the Aleutians. And it's present in both kelp forest and urchin barrens, and it's a perennial species. So I think it must, it has to compensate for herbivory. If it's present, it's dealing with the conditions there. There's been some previous work with the annual um, dragon kelp, that Eularia fistulosa, and um, this group didn't find differences in defensive compounds in the reproductive tissue, whether the dragon kelp was present in urchin barren or a kelp forest. So I think potentially using this perennial species might be a good place to try to look for this. So for the questions and hypotheses for this chapter, I um, uh, first, does growth and defense allocation of urchin barren codium vary across space? So I hypothesize that urchin barren codium would grow less, but be better defended with increasing intensity of herbivory in urchin barrens. But we also know that nutrition and light could affect that relationship. Second, does codium defense versus growth vary between a kelp forest and an urchin barren? And we'd hypothesize that the urchin barren codium would have less growth, but greater defense. So you have, um, you're dealing with higher herbivory, you don't have to grow as much, you have to protect yourself. And that's relative to the kelp forest codium that would have to grow more, it's dealing with competition um, of other macroalgae uh, shading them, but doesn't have to deal with herbivory. And then lastly, how does light affect codium growth and defense? Potentially what we see across space or between habitats might be due to uh, differences in light. So we'd hypothesize that um, there'd be higher growth and lower defense at low light. So that's simulating what you would see in a kelp forest under this low light condition. And then you'd hypothesize um, codium would have lower growth but greater defense in this high light. So for the first question, does growth and defense allocation of urchin barren codium vary across space? I collected urchin barren codium from seven different Aleutian islands. And then I also collected um, urchin barren codium, oh, sorry, codium from the kelp forest at Atu, and then um, collected urchins from this last island, Unaska, on our way back. So we brought all these urchins back to Katsitsna Bay Lab near Homer, Alaska, and um, I put five individuals from um, uh, the codium that was from both the, the urchin barrens at the seven islands and then the kelp forest into 41.2 liter tanks. Two of those tanks were used to estimate growth of codium at an island and they lacked urchins. And then three of those tanks were used to estimate grazing rates by urchins on, on the uh, codium. And I wanted to incorporate an estimate of codium nutrition 
and light, and then also intensity of herbivory and how that affects growth and defense in codium. So what I did was I used a principal component analysis. Um, I got an estimate of codium nutrition, which is the carbon to nitrogen ratio, an estimate of the light in the field. We deployed sensors um, in these locations over 36 hours. And then also um, uh, others collected um, urchin biomass estimates using quadrats at the site that I collected these codium individuals. And then I used linear regression between the um, uh, different PC axes and um, this index that I'll talk about, which is the amount of codium, uh, the amount of codium that grew versus was consumed. So when we look at the percent change in wet weight of codium over 17 days in this lab experiment, um, the islands go from um, west to east. We see that there's differences among islands. And then um, this Atu kelp forest uh, codium had some of the greatest growth and um, some of the lowest defense, or the most was consumed. So this was used as sort of an outgroup to give some context to these urchin barren samples. Uh, we can calculate this index, which is, which is the difference between how much uh, codium grew and then how much they defended, and you get the, uh, these values. And that's what I'm gonna use as the response variable. So when we look at the principal component analysis of the, um, an estimate of the codium uh, nutrition, that's C to N ratio, the amount of light at the site of collection, and then the um, uh, an estimate of the intensity of herbivory, the average biomass of urchins, we see that there are differences among islands. So we can test the relationship between how much codium grew versus how much it defended, and this first principal component, so the nutrition and light go from the left to the right, and we don't see a relationship but when we look at the second principal component, so biomass, the average biomass of urchins, we see that the amount that codium grew or defended uh, decreases as you increase the average urchin biomass. So these individuals with, that were collected at sites with very high uh, average urchin biomass, they grew very little in the lab, but little of them was consumed. So second, does codium uh, defense versus growth allocation vary between kelp forest and urchin barrens? So I performed a field caging experiment at Camper's Cove on Adak Island. And uh, what we did was collected individual codium from a kelp forest and from a barren at a site. And then we uh, divided a single individual into these uh, open, partial, and then caged treatments. So this block considers the autogenic growth of a single individual. And then we put, these, um, we put these blocks out at Camper's Cove and looked at the change in wet weight over 17 days. And so we uh, used a two-way ANOVA to look at the effects of habitat, so whether they came from a kelp forest or an urchin barren, and then the effects of the treatment. And I'm not sure how well this video is gonna play, but this gives you a look at what the treatment looks like and then the site looks like. You'll see a lot of green blobs around, hopefully, and that's the codium growing on the bottom. And then these, uh, little gray circles are the urchins. So there's um, a lot of codium here and there's also high, um, high urchin biomass. So I think this, this was a good place um, to do this. So when we look at the results, this is the percent change in codium uh, wet weight over 17 days. And these are samples that were sourced from the urchin barren. We see that um, in these open treatments, when they're exposed to grazing, the, um, uh, there's tissue that's lost on, on average. In the cage treatments, they gain tissue on average. We can bring in the urchin barren samples. So when, you, when codium sourced from um, a kelp forest, we get some context for what's going on. So in the urchin barren, we see that there's greater defense relative to the kelp forest um, codium. They lost less tissue over 17 days relative to the kelp uh, individuals. And then they also, um, they had less growth. So the individuals from, um, sampled from the urchin barren lost, um, uh, didn't gain as much wet weight tissue over that 17 days relative to the kelp forest. Um, and then it's the opposite for the kelp forest. We saw um, most of that tissue got, a lot of that more tissue got consumed in the open treatments, uh, but more tissue grew in the cage treatments. So that suggests there might be differences in growth and defense of these, these macroalgae. And I'd also like to mention that um, we see relatively wide variability and how much wet weight uh, was gained in certain individuals. Potentially these codium individuals didn't have um, as much herbivory, and so they were growing a lot more. And these individuals 
were um, exposed to herbivory, and so they lost a lot of tissue. So the same variability that we see um, for codium sourced from a kelp forest um, among these treatments uh, between the urchin, uh, the urchin, the open and the cage, we also see within these treatments. So how does light affect codium growth in events? Uh, I wanted to test if growth was greater at lower light, so you're in this kelp forest condition, or if defense was greater, uh, and if defense was greater at higher light, the conditions that you expect in this urchin barren. So using ANCOVA to test for the effects of light and then treatment, whether urchins were present or absent, and ran uh, linear regressions when urchins were just present, uh, when urchins were absent and urchins were present. And then I ran a multiple regression with light and then also urchin weight, obviously when urchins were just present. So what did I expect to see? Um, if light was important in driving some of the variation we saw between habitats and across space, um, we'd expect this relationship. So here's the percent change in codium wet weight over 20 days, increasing light on the x-axis. Without urchins present, but with codium present, uh, we would expect codium to grow a lot under low light. So it's simulating these kelp forest conditions they're gonna grow a lot, it's gonna stimulate growth. Under higher light in an urchin barren, they might not grow as much, and it's because they're allocating more energy to the fence. And then when an urchin's present with codium, we'd expect more tissue to be lost uh, under lower light. Urchins are consuming more of that tissue because these individuals are allocating more energy to growth. And then at higher light, less tissue would be consumed, potentially because they're allocating more energy to the fence. So what did we find? Um, here's the percent change in codium wet weight over 20 days and increasing light. The urchin absent treatments in blue and urchin present treatments in red. And we do see more variability at lower light and less variability at higher light. That is something that we'd expect to see, but there isn't a clear relationship um, uh, here for either of those treatments. And here on the right, we're sh um, showing the um, light values that we collected in the field. So here's, um, the light values from the kelp forest, it's about 10 micromolar uh, up to about 90 micromolar for that urchin barren. So this is to show that we were using light levels that were um, uh, indicative of those field conditions. When we look at the multiple regression, here's the percent change in codium wet weight over 20 days, urchin weight and then light. Uh, urchin weight's explaining a lot of the variation and uh, relative to light. So we can just look at this um, percent change in codium wet weight over 20 days and urchin weight and we see this strong um, negative relationship. So larger urchins did eat more codium tissue, and I think this also uh, relates back to um, the experiment with uh, greater intensity of herbivory um, done by larger uh, average urchin biomass at the site of collection. So in conclusion, we found a geographic variation in growth and defense in the lab. So islands that had uh, higher urchin biomass um, had codium with less growth, but more defense. We looked at habitat level variation using that field caging experiment. We found that kelp forest codium had greater growth, but less defense. And then urchin barren codium had less growth and more defense. So this might help explain why urchins are able to move into kelp forest habitats. Uh, if they're able to get there, um, those algae might be um, less defended, especially for perennial species. We found mixed effects of light and growth in defense in the lab. Um, that experiment probably sh should be redone in the field. Um, there might have been potential um, factors for that lab experiment that affected how much codium grew or how much tissue was lost. So overall, the intensity of herbivory between habitats and across space may shift how macroalgae grow and defend. And so adapting that framework from the terrestrial environment uh, to codium, See that under these high, uh, uh, under high competition, codium is going to uh, grow more uh, and allocate less to defense. And then as you increase um, uh, herbivory, they're going to see shifts towards um, uh, greater defense and lower growth. So I think this is a good framework to look at um, how primary producers are allocating energy to growth or defense, um, especially for perennials. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank um, uh, Matt and Brenda for um, getting me up to the Aleutians. I got to ride on their coattails and experience um, what all of these papers um, are about that I've read. And you dive these urchin barrens and you see this moonscape and it, is, um, it was eye-opening. I wasn't expecting to see what we saw. <laughs>
Um, a big thank you to uh, both the Edward and Conar Labs for help in the field. I couldn't have gotten the collections that I got without them. A big thank you to the crew of the RV Oceanus who conducted two very successful trips, the Department of Fish and Wildlife for permitting, the Kitsitsna Bay NOAA Lab for allowing me to do experiments there. I, wasn't, I wouldn't have been able to try to decouple some of the things that we see in the field in the lab without this facility. Um, so I hope to do work there in the future. And then also Lisa Thurn at San Diego State Ecology Lab helped um, me run uh, a couple hundred of my samples and was also a sounding board for some of my ideas. So I first wanted to say um, I got a really good foundation from Moss Landing Marine Lab. Um, my <clears throat> committee was Dr. Uh, Diana Steller, Mike Graham, and Scott Hamilton. I got a great foundation from them, um, learned stats from Jim Harvey, and then was pushed in the multivariate realm by Matt. And so um, I can tell this foundation was really important for a lot of the, uh, the work that I was doing because I was referencing things that they've said uh, over time. So for my committee, huge thank you to Dr. Brian Gaylord. Um, he's been an amazing mentor. Uh, I gained a lot um, in how to conduct experimental, um, an experimental design in the lab, and I used those skills later on. So um, it was also great to see uh, Brian captivate a class of 300 students when I was TAing ecology at Davis. Um, the lab is an inc incredible group of scientists and people, and it was very motivating to be there. Um, and I got a lot of help from them. So huge thank you. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. Kevin Hovel. He's been a sounding board for statistical advice. And even recently, I'm sending uh, comments from reviewers on papers um, saying I'm confused. And he's, uh, he's been very helpful with um, helping me try to expand um, my statistical thinking. And uh, a huge thank you to Matt. Um, Matt is one of the most passionate, intelligent, and um, considerate uh, people I've ever met. He's uh, so passionate about what he does. He's so considerate of students. He's created a, an amazing lab with a, a great group. He's done things like make a tank rack in a matter of uh, what seemed like hours. And um, as you can see over time, I'm slowly becoming more and more like Matt. And um, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, Matt, oh, so I should say this first. So here are some of these chambers we designed for the uh, NSF grants. And the first set of chambers, I think were like three and a half feet on a side, and then we made three foot chambers. And so I'm gonna connect those two lines and make a regression. I know you're not supposed to do that, but eventually you're gonna get down to uh, this small size. And so I made you a little chamber that can fit on your desk and you can see how productive you are. Um, so I'll be, I'll be mailing that shortly. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Brenda Konar and her lab, um, depicted here. They were crucial to me getting my samples for um, my stabilized hope work and then also the Codium lab trials. Um, Dr. Ben Weitzman helped me a ton. He helped me get 300 urchins from Seward down to Kitsitsna Bay, um, and I think only like three urchins died. So he is an urchin whisperer. I'm, I'm so impressed. Uh, I got help by Dr. Joon Kim with the light experiments in the lab, uh, Dr. Doug Rasher with deploying those, um, the cage uh, the field caging experiment, and then um, uh, Jim Estes was a huge source of inspiration for a lot of this work. Um, a giant thank you to Beer Pigs, the benthic ecology and experimental research phycology in general group. So both at Moss Landing and uh, at San Diego State. Uh, this group is, uh, these groups have been amazing. It's such a great network of um, smart people that are excited, that um, can critique you, and, and uh, I think it's, it showed over time. I've become a much better scientist uh, because of this group. And um, huge thank you to my family, my dad Stan, and my mom Jody, as well as my sisters Katie and Carly. Uh, an immense amount of emotional support and oftentimes financial support uh, getting through both my master's and PhD. Um, a big thank you to my friends, um, Stephen, Will, Christian, Mike, and Scott Miller. They've, uh, they've been in, uh, a great support system and I hope we can get out um, backpacking again soon. A big thank you to um, my friends and colleagues at San Diego State. That includes the Marine Ecology and Biology Student Association, which is a great group both uh, socially and academically. Um, there's just a a great group of people that definitely helped me 
uh, to get over this finish line. And lastly, a, a big thank you to Kaylee. She's um, helped realign me when I would knee deep in statistical design uh, problems or uh, reviewer comments. And we would go out to a, a, a state or a national park and she'd help realign me. So I really appreciate her support. Um, with that, I'd love to take uh, questions or comments uh, or any postdoctoral positions that you have. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Scotty. Very nice. Um, so I am going to, uh, we're going to open this up to um, some questions for Scotty. We're going to start with his committee, um, but thank you. Um, I'm going to pass because we've talked so much about this and just yesterday went through a lot of this stuff again. So I'm going to pass to his committee um, and let me see if I can unmute. How do you unmute all in this? So you set this up, Scotty. So. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to, um, looks like exactly sure. Kevin's already unmuted. So um, questions for committee, uh, let's see who's here. Kevin, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure, happy to. Scotty, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed. Uh, just in awe of what you accomplished and, and how well you conveyed the messages, conclusions you found, so uh, you. awesome job. Um, I guess a couple of general things, one is, and you can maybe chalk this up to someone who's never been to your to your area, the study site. Um, you, it seems like in some parts of the dissertation, you're treating things as discrete entities, like a barren versus a kelp forest area, or an island has or has not had invasive foxes, things like that. But in another other context, you have animals that are that are moving. Fish are mobile. Seabirds are, are potentially moving among different places, and maybe you accounted for that. Mm -hmm. understand by your you know your increasing search area for for birds so i wonder if you could talk about your justification for treating things as discrete when when you did um understanding that organisms may be moving, maybe moving among these different these different areas or, or entities you know like did, yeah. is, is is it possible that fish are feeding in in both barren and kelp forest for example rather than one or the other so Yep, yep, that's a good point. Um, and that was a question I got at um, WSN by, I think, Jen Cassell also, um, about fish and whether uh, they're changing, altering their foraging or movement between a kelp forest and an urchin barren. And so I, I'm surprised too that we would see such stark differences between these habitats. Um, I think certain species may not be moving as much as we expected. I have um, some time lapse video of a GoPro in an urchin barren. And I'm looking to see, there are certain urch urchins that over about a couple hours, they move pretty fast, but a lot of these individuals are pretty slow moving. Um, and I, I think some of them are actually encompassing uh, or collecting and are good integrators of the um, primary producers and consumers that are in these habitats. Um, certain like fish, like things like greenling, they have very small home ranges. Um, but um, other fish, like I also collected rockfish, they have a greater home range. Um, so I think, yeah, I think trying to incorporate movement ecology into this uh, would be pretty important for the next step. Um, but it does seem like the consumers that are in these habitats, even though they're so close to one another often, are actually reflecting the resources that are there. Okay. And then second, um, you know, your study did a fantastic job of using the the system that's out there, the differences out there among islands and, and places to uh, account for factors you're interested in. Um, but nonetheless, you didn't manipulate things, right? Uh, well, at least in maybe the first couple of chapters. So you're talking about, for example, the effect of biodiversity on uh, food web structure and things like that. You actually didn't really, you didn't, you didn't have a loss of biodiversity that you actually witnessed or, or caused. And so I'm wondering, generally speaking, given your study relies on the natural history and differences in variability that's out there, how you, how you feel like you accounted for the factors that you stress personally, that you observe to be important, like foxes, for example, um, versus things that may have been going along with those things like why did foxes invade some other islands and not others why do barons exist in some places and not others um hmm. 
Yeah, I think at least the, the observational approach that I had for the among habitat comparison, um, I didn't calculate a biodiversity estimate, uh, but others have, and I'm sort of using that. Um, I think, yeah, pushing this work forward, you would perform some sort of mesocosm and have different amounts of diversity of the community and seeing what that trophic structure looks like, which is probably a good step. Um, I do think I accounted fairly well for some of the main players. So there's certain um, taxonomic groups that are important, like for primary producers, red algae have a very distinct isotope signature. Some of those brown algae are very distinct and they're more deplete in this carbon. And so I, I do think we're seeing these shifts in, in communities because there's this loss of these uh, particular species. Um, so because there are these differences in isotopes, I think we're, for certain groups, I think we have pretty good resolution. And that is one thing that I wanna look at is uh, dividing, dividing up um, each one of the taxa into different uh, taxonomic, uh, like a taxonomic hierarchy. And then I can go, okay, is this, is this phyla range or is this family range? Do they all behave in the same way? Um, so yeah, I think I, I, think I did um, the best I could with those, those, using those habitats to my advantage. But um, yeah, really teasing those apart with experiments is, is gonna tell a lot more. Thanks, Scotty. Okay, um, other committee members. Scotty, do you uh, have a list of the people we've got? I've seen Brian on um, there. Brian, yeah. Scotty, really, really beautiful thesis. Uh, congratulations to you on completing this mammoth effort. Um, I will also say you did a very nice job. I didn't realize this was so much a proposal defense where I was supposed to show up with hard questions. So you did a very effective job of obscuring that from me. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you a difficult question, but I, I am curious about a couple of things. Um, one is what's, what's maybe the most surprising thing that you, that you learned or saw during your time. And then I'm also curious about where you're gonna take this research next as you move into uh, whatever postdoc offer you're gonna have after this talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I, well, first, uh, like Kevin had said, um, I was surprised first looking at these isotope values of consumers in these different habitats. I was thinking there weren't, weren't gonna be these dramatic effects. Um, just like Kevin had mentioned, there, animals are moving around, these habitats are also close to one another, there should be a good amount of connectivity between them. Um, so when I first plotted those isotope values, I went, okay, something is going on. And then um, I'd say that relationship with, with seabirds, I was expecting temperature to be driving most of the variation we see in nutrients for these food webs. And um, I would think that seabirds would play sort of a minimal role. And um, I think they're contributing as much variation or more variation for certain taxa. So um, yeah, I, I think sometimes we see these patterns. I didn't believe it. Um, and I, I just kept delving deeper. And um, yeah, I think both of those um, were shocking. And then also that my experiment with light didn't work out so well in the lab. Uh, I was expecting these clear relationships and maybe that's a good lesson for ecology. You don't always get exactly what you were expecting and then to learn from it and go, okay, maybe we need to do this light experiment in the field. And then um, for the future, I think two of the things I'm interested in doing are applying some of this knowledge about uh, isotope variability and um, biodiversity to kelp restoration. We can sample communities over time to see if they're restored to this uh, state of uh, ecological function of, of proper food web uh, complexity is kind of one direction. And then the other direction is um, thinking more about consumer derived nutrients and whether they help um, primary producer communities um, by reducing spatial and temporal variation. So maybe these consumer derived nutrients are important in certain places. Maybe those are good places to do aquaculture. Uh, maybe those are good places to um, you know, protect. So I think expanding on those sort of two areas are kind of the current proposals that I've, I've, uh, I've made. Wonderful, thank you, Scotty, and, and congrats again. Thank really. you, Brian. Scotty, is there another? Remember here, or we can open it up. To, no, um, we can we can open it up. Question to um, a couple of students, and then we'll have faculty. Yeah, you know, we'll do this for a few. So you, 
I'm looking at the list of people. If you raise a hand or something, I can call on you. Otherwise, a few of us, if somebody just wants to go. Um, okay, if somebody just wants to ask, uh, go ahead. Oh, there we go. Um, looks like uh, Jay, uh, uh, Jay Zekowitz, go ahead. Hey, Scotty, how's it going? Hey, Jay, going um, pretty well. <laughs> thanks. It was great to see all this uh, finally coming together. Uh, very cool. Um, I'm curious, going back to the stable isotope stuff in the first chapter, so um, I'm thinking particularly about the offshore versus kelp forest comparison. And, um, you know, so changing niche breadth in that can be to two reasons, right? It can either be because there are more, you're changing the number of options available or, you're beca or because you're changing the selectivity of the consumers. And it sounded like you were sort of aiming at the selectivity of consumers changing. But I'm curious whether you think that the relative abundance of options is, is the same in those or, or you know, how those two factors might sort of play in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of hard to de decouple for just for those consumers offshore because um, it's hard to say what they're doing out there. I think there is definitely a, a, a variety of different resources coming in. There's you know, phytoplankton, there's detritus, there's probably other uh, consumers that are degrading. They're sort of scavenging at that point. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I can quite decouple knowing without knowing more about the feeding ecology of those of those specific um, those taxa. I think there's also something going on with uh, microbial uh, degradation, microbes um, reworking material, and that increases these nitrogen isotope variability in the offshore. Um, Aaron Galloway has um, shown some of that stable isotope data, so it's it's really hard to say what's going on. And I think that warrants um, further work, maybe comparing the exact same taxa, uh, making sure that I, I the, that parallel sampling is exactly the same. Then I can go, okay, I know how this taxa feeds. It's, uh, it, it's different in the offshore. Um, and then finding more about is, is it movement? Um, is it, what are the gut contents? And then um, I think I can better find out what, what that variability is actually coming from. Yeah, well, I don't think anyone's going to say you have to do more work um, as part of this thesis. I think we can all appreciate that there's plenty that, you know, that, that you've done here. I just was thinking about, um, you know, you can get a broad range of uh, sort of feeding niche space for the two reasons, right? And so making sure you think about both of those options, whether it's selectivity or uh, availability or some combination of those two, right? So like, that's always the uh, totally. thing to think about. But very, very cool work. It was great to see. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Yeah, I did. I did want to. I didn't end up collecting sediment, organic matter from the collection sites, and I think that would have helped. Go, oh, these sediment, organic matter, isotope signatures are all over the place. That might help suggest there's primary producers that are coming in offshore and um, creating a lot of variability. So, yeah, I'll think about that, and that's something I should add to the paper that's in review. <laughs> cool. Um, I see a, qu a hand by Brian. Uh, we'll <clears throat> question. Yeah. Hey. Or let him go. Yeah, Scotty, uh, really great talk and uh, an impressive amount of data, which while you didn't really underscore exactly how many days you were out in the field, I'm sure they were extremely busy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so really great work. And, and I don't want to, um, after Jay just made a comment about nobody expects you to do more work, I'm, I'm certainly not posing this question in this way, but it's more of things to think about, especially when you have papers in review. Um, in addition to the spatial differences isotopically in, in what's going on in the food web, um, there's, there's also temporal things that could be going on. Um, I think a, a minute ago you mentioned something about, you know, the, the way taxon feeds and there are also going to be some of these taxa that have different life stages and particularly for things that are either, um, more rapidly growing juvenile stages or uh, adults that are that are engaged in reproductive activity. Um, they may not only be feeding differently, but their isotopic turnover times are going to be different. And, you know, the, the Aleutians are not a great place to do a, a, a seasonal year round sort of study if, if anyone could even contemplate no, such a thing. But, um, but I'm wondering about whether you know, some taxa that have 
limited isotopic variability and others that have much greater isotopic breadth, how, how you might be able to inform or constrain some of that based on reasonable assumptions about isotopic turnover times or pulses and blooms of certain organisms at one time that might be a limited, temporally limited food resource for some consumers, but not for others. Um, totally. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's definitely a limitation with uh, having this, this snapshot. And most of these isotope values for muscle are about, you know, a, a few months, maybe 90 days. So we're kind of getting a, a window back in time and not necessarily what's going on right then. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I think um, actually I'm working with the Navy and NOAA on uh, San Diego Bay um, seagrass food webs, trying to figure out what green sea turtles eat. And I think uh, working with these taxonomists has been very helpful because now I have this um, gradient in uh, taxa and kingdom phylum class. And I can look at, um, try to identify where most of the variation is, that isotopic variation, at least for these, these snapshots that we have. Um, so yeah, I think incorporating that is going to be really important. And um, yeah, I think <laughs> definitely the snapshots are, are, are pretty limited and working in San Diego is going to probably be better than working in Lucian's for the future. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, so I'll ask for one more question and then I'm going to, um, after that, we'll going to take some of that, the faculty into a, a breakout room, um, just to chat with Scotty. So if there, and we'll describe that in a second, but are there any other questions? Go ahead and either raise your hand or don't see anyone coming in. Okay. So, um, well, everyone, thank you very much. We're going to let Scotty off the hot seat now. Well, the one hot seat. Um, and um, what I'd like to do here is invite everyone. You can stay here if you want to. Um, just hang out for a bit on this. We're going to take, um, I'm going to, we've created a breakout room. We're going to bring some of the, I'm um, the committee and some of the faculty into the breakout room, have a chat with Scotty um, right afterwards, and then um, send Scotty back to uh, the rest of you. And then um, Scotty's got a little um, a happy hour later on that he can tell you all about. But um, anyways, I want to say thank you very much, Scotty. Well done. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Okay, so I'm going to try to get in, figure out the breakout room here. Breakout, I'm going to figure out how to add people. So I'm going to uh, bring uh, people over and if you